What is up, everybody? Welcome to the Fantasy Flex Podcast. I am your host, Chris Raybon of the Action Network, and this is our AFC East Fantasy Preview episode. Here to break it down with me, one of the top rankers in the game, Sean Kerner. Sean, what it do? Uh, it's going good. How, how about you? How's New York? You have fun? New York is good. I've been move. I mean, I'm back in LA now. I've been moving all around. I was in New York uh, last weekend. I'm, I'm out in Denver uh, this weekend. So, nice. uh, yeah, I've been moving around, but uh, got to make sure to touch down <laughs> so you can uh, get these episodes popping. And uh, oh, yeah. we're going to go pretty in depth in, in, in these yeah. for the next uh, four weeks. We're going to do, uh, we're going to have two divisions per week. So, uh, stay tuned for those, everybody. And uh, we're going to jump right into it. This episode the AFC East, just kind of touching on every fantasy relevant player who we think is undervalued, overvalued, and properly valued uh, in terms of early June average draft position. So let's start it off with the Buffalo Bills. Uh, I'm going to go in order of division odds for for this. So we'll start with the Bills, then we'll go to the Jets, Dolphins, and then Patriots. So Josh Allen is the QB2 only behind Jalen Hurts. He was the QB2 or better uh, in each of the last three seasons in terms of fantasy points per game among quarterbacks that played eight games or more. Uh, And in 2022, top five finishes in 11 of 16 games. And he was top 12 in all but one game. And and that was still a QB18 finish. So, I mean, this guy is just super consistent uh, I mean, it, are there any holes to poke in jo- in Josh Allen headed into 2023? No, there are not. And I guess the days of us getting Jalen Hurts outside of the top six are over uh, by the sound of it. Yep. But I, I still have Josh Allen QB1. Um, I still think he has a higher four ceiling combo than Hurts, but it's very close. And last year he would have been the, – he finishes a QB2, but he would have been the QB1 had they actually played – um, the Bills Bengals game, you know, they had to postpone it due to DeMar Hamlin's injury, uh, but he would have been the QB one. Um, so I have no reason to rank him below number one. I thought, you know, I was a bit worried last year. You know, they lost offensive corner Brian Dable to the Giants, obviously, but Ken Dorsey picked up where he left off. So it didn't really have that, that much of an impact on the offense. Josh Allen is still a, you know, a major dual threat quarterback. Um, he's actually seen his passing yards and touchdowns per game go down each of the last three seasons with it with his rush attempts and yards a game going up each of the last three seasons so he turns 27 this season I think we could see that trend start to reverse I don't know how much longer he's going to lean on his legs but either way he just has that massive floor ceiling combo he still has Stephon Diggs Gabe Davis Um, they arguably picked you know the best pass catching tight end in this class so I think Dalton Kincaid adds a new element to this offense. So I, like I said, I'm still projecting Josh Allen as a QB one heading into this season. Yeah, I think it's really tough to find anything major to kind of, uh, you know, knock Josh Allen for. I think maybe, like you said, you know, the the one thing you could kind of point to is maybe at some point the, the rushing production starts to reverse a little bit. Uh, but you look at the tight end, like you said, uh, they, they got better at tight end. I actually think they got better at the McKenzie position because I think Deontay Hardy is actually uh, a better receiver than Isaiah McKenzie. Uh, you know, James Cook may add a little more to that, um, to the receiving game as, as a pass catcher than, than Singletary. You still got Hines if you ever want to take him out the bubble wrap and, and put him on <laughs> no offense. Kidding. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, maybe the rushing production and obviously I think the one – uh, there would be a pretty uh, like uh, I, I would say a downtick if Stefan Diggs were were to miss time. I, I think that's probably mm-hmm. the one thing. But you know, for wide receivers, a guy like Diggs has been pretty durable uh, over these last few years, so that's not a very high probability. But I, I, that's probably the only thing I could think of that would knock Josh Allen down. Yeah. You know, more than like like one or two pegs. You know, he'd probably be more in the QB five six ish range, maybe. Yeah. If uh, if Diggs were out, but uh, still high floor. High ceiling quarterback is Josh Allen. Uh, yeah, I like him as QB one as well. By the way, I know he's, uh, he is QB two. I, I think and when you look at uh, Jalen Hurts, I think he has a little more potential to regress. Um, and Patrick Mahomes, you know, I know there he he's been great, but 
not quite the rushing production of, the, of those other two guys. Yep. Uh, James Cook, RB29. And uh, by the way, we're using best ball uh, mm-hmm. ADP from the past two weeks. Uh, so trying to get it, it as accurate as possible, but still give it somewhat of a sample size. Not much has happened in the last two weeks. Uh, so it should be pretty good to go here. James Cook is the RB29. And I know we were kind of a little hesitant on Cook, uh, uh, you know, post-draft. He was starting to creep up into the top, you know, near the top 24 mm-hmm. But what do you think about him at RB29? Yeah, it looks like his ADP's dipped a bit. Um, the last time I was talking about him, he was around RB24, which I thought was a little bit too high for him. Um, I have him right around RB27, so I'm pretty much in line with the ADP right now. Now, he did he had a disappointing rookie season, um, and you have to wonder if the fact that he fumbled his very first touch, if you remember, opening night yep, on yep. Thursday Night Football against the Rams, if that set him back a bit because he didn't really – Uh, get much work uh, for the first half of the season. The only time he saw five or more rush attempts um, was in blowout games um, in the first half of the season. But ultimately his talent did prevail and it did allow him to eat into Singletary's workload uh, in the second half of the season. Um, And he didn't, he came out of college as being one of the top pass catching back, but he didn't top 25% routes run rate until week 13, which was basically why he had a disappointing rookie season. I thought he was going to be clearing 50% uh, from the get-go. Um, so I think heading into this year, we can expect him to be averaging closer to 60% routes run per game, being the true passing down back. However, you know, they brought in Damian Harris, Latavius Murray. So I, I think that is going to cap his ceiling. I think they are going to use those backs pretty heavily on the early downs. So I, I don't think we can really count on James Cook to be a true workhorse back. So that's why his ceiling is limited. But I think with the receiving work, he should have a high enough floor to be in the RB3 flex range. So I kind of do like his his ADP where he is right now. But again, I just don't know if his ceiling is, you know, RB1 status, even if one of the other running backs were to go down. Yeah, I think back to Devin Singletary, and there was a few stretches uh, over the last couple of seasons where Singletary started playing on 90 plus percent yeah. of the snaps. And I don't necessarily know if Cook – will do that. Although I will say this, you know, Damian Harris uh, at times has struggled with, with his durability, 14 missed games over the past three seasons, questionable in nine more. And he's had 10 different injuries over, over that span. So, you know, if if Harris does get hurt, you know, Naeem Hines, they were really reluctant to use him last season, just 3.7 routes per game uh, and, under a carry per game for Naeem Hines as a Buffalo Bill. So it, it is possible, but, uh, you know, Brandon Bean has said, and the GM Brandon Bean has said, you know, we're going to give him an expanded workload. We're going to give him more touches. And you look at Singletary and he's averaged about 11 carries per game over the last two years. And that was good enough for a running back 27, 28 finish. So I agree. I think he's properly priced yeah. uh, at this point. Um, but maybe doesn't have that, you know, top five, top, top eight upside, but should be a pretty uh, safe play because I I don't think Damian Harris is going to be a massive factor. He only got 1 million guaranteed. Uh, Latavius Murray got 800 K guaranteed. So, I mean, it's not even a, there might be more of a competition than we think for that big back Zach Moss role. But uh, I think, you know, going to Harris, who's the RB 41, He's the guy I actually struggle with a little more because in, in 2022, Buffalo's non-Devin Singletary carries amounted to about seven per game. Damian Harris has never averaged even one and a half targets per game. Yeah, uh, you know he, he's he, he's about one in one point four for his career. Uh, excuse me. So, you know, I, the path catching work's not really going to be there. Don't know if Buffalo is necessarily going to get super run heavy to where yeah. you're talking about, you know, more than seven or eight non Singletary carries. So at RB 41, this is an, this is one I'd probably say has more downsides and upside because mm. this is Harris is really a guy. I can't see getting, you know, 90% of the snaps because he yeah. doesn't, he doesn't really do much on passing downs. I think then you would just see more Naeem Hines. So uh, talk to me about how you feel about Harris. 
Yeah, no, I agree. I, usually the 41 range is for handcuffs and certainly Damian Harris is one, but even if um, James Cook were to go down, which you alluded to, I think just Naheem Hines would step right into that role. So Damian Harris is pretty much capped um, from the get-go. And just just backing up a little bit with the Bills, it's always – like for the past few seasons, I always feel like we should invest in Bills running backs because it's such a potent, high-scoring offense. But it rarely works out because this is Josh Allen's offense. You know, he doesn't throw to running backs much. He scores a ton of touchdowns around the goal line. So he kind of saps a lot of the value we would get from being in a high uh, octane offense. Um, so not unless we see what we saw at the, at the end of the 2021 season, where they just said, Devin Singletary, just be our workhorse back. That was the only time we were able to get like a true RB2, RB1 potential out of the Bills backfield. So just heading into the season, it does look like a sort of murky two to three way committee which caps everyone's upsides. So, um, yeah, I'm definitely out on Harris at RB41. And going back to just James Cook, the fact that he's the pass catching back on a team with a win total of, what, 11 and a half right now, doesn't bode well because, you know, most of their game scripts are going to be leading game scripts and they won't have to throw that much to the running back. So I, I just think everybody's ceiling is capped too much to really invest uh, their current ADP. Yeah, I mean, I, I would still say, like, again, I think – I agree, but I think Cook is more properly valued in yeah. terms of his median, uh, whereas I think Harris may be a little bit overvalued. Like I, I, I can see Harris being a bust. You know, when you combined the propensity for missed games with the fact that I, I can't even really see a route to to more than you know <laughs> eight eight nine carries a game, uh, unless unless you you see an injury to Cook. You know, uh, yeah. So yeah, there, there's a guy. Uh, he's going one slot below James Cook, Alexander Madison, who could have a news <laughs> item happen in the next couple weeks that makes him a borderline RB1. Right. You know, so uh, those are the kind of players I'm interested in investing in this range over Cook. But like Absolutely. you said, he, he's properly priced right now. All right. Uh, and yeah, Hines, you know, looks like he's just kind of yeah. going to be that RB3. He's the Taiwan Jones of this offense <laughs> it, it seems to be Hines. But if Hines does play more, it, like, like again, I think James Cook, like we have a precedent with him. We have Devin Singletary who, you know, kind of played about, you know, two thirds of the time, didn't necessarily play every single pass down snap, still did enough to kind of get to that, you know, in the top 30. Whereas mm -hmm. if Naeem Hines starts playing uh, just a little bit more than he did last year, uh, that that's it for Damian Harris. So yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think Harris just a lot more downside exactly. uh, than upside. Let's go to wide receiver. We got Stefan Diggs clocking in at the wide receiver five in ADP. And he's been extremely consistent the past three years. You've had uh, three top 10 finishes in terms of uh, points per game. He's gotten as high as wide receiver three last year. He was the wide receiver five in PPR. Uh, and the wide receiver six in half PPR points per game uh, among wide receivers with at least eight games played. So, you know, kind of a just ho hum, boring, you know, this is what he is. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Do you have extreme, any kind extremely of extremely good? But anything yeah. groundbreaking here? On no, Stephon I Diggs? mean, just we know who he is. He's as re reliable as it gets. Um, you know, he's going to be turning 30 towards the end of the season. I wouldn't worry about that. I think he still has one more just elite season and then maybe next year. We start to see the production drop off. Uh, but I'm a fan of locking up wide receivers at this part mm -hmm. in the draft. Um, so if he's available, it makes sense. He's really in a log jam. I, I, you could argue Diggs, Devontae Adams, CeeDee Lamb, Amon Ross St. Brown could be in this wide receiver, wide receiver five slot. Um, but yeah, like Diggs, just one of the highest floors. Uh, like you said, just another ho-hum good season for him coming up. Yeah, and, you know, I, I noticed his targets per route run actually went up from 2021 from about 24% to about 26, a little over 26%. So, yeah, he's showing no signs of slowing down. And I, I know the Buffalo did add some uh, pass catchers, you know, below digs on the depth chart and at tight end. But, you know, when you talk about a, a target hog wide receiver one, that's usually not going to affect them. It's just going to kind of affect the distribution below them. So you can kind of expect – uh, a guy like Diggs to continue performing uh, at the rate that we've seen him. And I mean, 
you know, it, it's, it, it's, it's a very high rate. So very high yeah. level. So uh, let's talk about Gabe Davis. Cause I, I know you like him what? this year <laughs> and I, you, you, this is, I never thought I'd say this, but you like him, <laughs> I think a lot more than I do. I'm, yeah. I'm a bit kind of skeptical. Um, I, I, I should say uncertain as of now anyway, about uh, the range of outcomes for Gabe Davis. So uh, talk to me about Gabe and uh, and why you like him. He's at wide receiver 41, by the way. Yeah, so here we go again. I'm pretty high on Gabe Davis. Uh, but I will admit, you know, he definitely didn't meet the high expectations I had for him last year. I think, you know, we can say he's a little bit too inconsistent. Uh, he's probably better for best ball. Like, he's not that consistent wide receiver, too. I thought he could be. But having said that, um, you know, he still had a strong season. He still finishes as a wide receiver 27. Uh, he only felt like a bust just because he was so inconsistent. But, you know, coming up with some excuses for him last year, we have to remember he missed week two due to an ankle injury. And I thought he returned a little bit too soon. I remember the couple games after that, he seemed pretty limited. Um, and then we I forgot to mention it, but Josh Allen had that pretty scary elbow injury in week nine to his UCL, UCL nerve. Um, and he seemed a little less willing to throw downfield. He struggled for a couple games after that. So there were a couple stretches where I can kind of make an excuse for Gabe Davis. But at the end of the day, you know, he's the main deep threat, uh, which makes him pretty volatile week to week. So, you know, getting him outside of the wide receiver three range makes a ton of sense this year. I think we're getting him at a pretty good price. So I think he does bounce back this year uh, with sort of the season I was expecting last year. I think everything's going to line up and we're getting him at a cheaper price. But I think he's just an amazing investment in best ball because you don't have to figure out which weeks he's going to go off. But I, I will be the first one to admit that he is a little, he's going to be inconsistent. So my thing about Gabe Davis is I, he obviously retains his, you know, top 15 ish ceiling. You know, if he has a bunch of those big games, you know, maybe yeah. an outlier, you know, one, two, three more, you know, two or three more, I guess. So then, then, you know, you would kind of expect, He's going to, you know, kind of crack that top 30 and probably even the top 25. But here's why I think there is some downside that balances that out. Uh, Buffalo was reportedly one of the two teams, mm -hmm. along with Kansas City, that was pursuing a trade for DeAndre Hopkins. So what that tells me is that um, they aren't completely happy with Gabe Davis as the, the wide receiver, too, because Hopkins would obviously, you know, be ahead of him. Uh, if if they acquired him yep. and Buffalo, I've seen them anywhere from about plus five fifty to plus three two fifty or three hundred uh, to land Hopkins. So some somewhere in that you know twelve to 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 twenty percent range chance. So there's it's a there's a non zero chance uh, that Buffalo does end up uh, signing Hopkins. And then the other thing, you know, that that's one part of the downside that, you know, until Hopkins gets signed, I'm going to feel a little uneasy about, about Gabe yeah. Davis. But uh, the other thing is, you know, now that we're three years into his career, you know, wide receivers tend to break out year two, year three. And with Davis, you know, we've kind of now seen what he is. He's never topped 18% targets per route. Uh, even last season when he was that clear number two wide receiver, uh, he he was he was still hovering in that 16 17 percent range, uh, never top 57 percent catch rate, and uh, you know never top 3.2 catches per game. And still, you know, even though we saw that massive touchdown game, and and I I, I think this is the one he could probably top the easiest, but he still never scored half a touchdown a game in the regular season. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, th now that we have a bigger sample, we kind of know what he is. I, I think the projection is a little bit more toned down in terms of the, you know, okay, if we expect him to kind of play this role, this is what we're going to get out of him. Um, and so that kind of combined with the, the, the fact that there is some downside just because maybe they aren't totally happy. Maybe they are looking for a, a guy like Deandre Hopkins who would come in and, you know, command probably, you know, seven, eight targets per game, even with Stefan Diggs there. Um, you know, that that's kind of why I think Davis Davis is probably properly rated um, or even a little overrated right now, um, just considering the downside. But, you know, the massive upside kind of I would say he's probably properly rated at, at 41, but I'm not ready to say that he's undervalued yet until we get Hopkins 
kind of off the board and on and on somebody's team. Yeah, no, those are all fair points. And yeah, the the potential Hopkins signing certainly adds a wrinkle. Um, I don't know if it's as good as f- close to five to one odds. I think it's a little bit less likely than that. But if Hopkins were to go to the Bills, I would obviously downgrade Gabe Davis. And a lot of the fair criticisms that Davis has had over the past couple of seasons certainly make sense. So uh, that's fair. I, I still love his upside at this price. So we can agree to disagree here. Uh, and then, you know, Kawir Shakir, I mean, going his wide receiver 87. I, I know some people are going to kind of be hyped about him. I actually think Deontay Hardy might end up with that wide receiver mm. three role if they don't sign Hopkins. Uh, he got over five million guaranteed. And, and Isaiah McKenzie, who, you know, they could have just brought back, he got 400K guaranteed. <laughs> so, yeah. so they paid about 10X more. More than 10x for Deontay Hardy and Brandon Bean said he was going to play inside and outside. And a lot of people would be surprised because he's like 5'6", 170, but he actually has played more outside in his career uh, than inside. Uh, He's a better run blocker than Shakir somehow. Uh, So, yeah, I think Shakir, you know, especially when you consider that you could get Hopkins, which would push Shakir potentially as low as wide receiver five and as high as, you know, the, the ceiling would be wide receiver four in that case. Uh, you also have Kincaid, who could end up being uh, yep. like, a, like a de facto slot receiver, which still means uh, Shakir may, may likely be like the fifth option. Uh, yeah, I, I really, I, I'm not feeling Shakir. I usually like these guys, you know, heading into year two, but I, I just think the way the Bills have been moving this off season, you know, trying to sign Hopkins, going and getting Kincaid, yeah. uh, giving, giving over 5 million to Deontay Hardy uh, kind of tells you that, you know, not just maybe Gabe Davis, but maybe Shakir is, is a guy that maybe still a year away, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, that's where I'm at with him. I think, you know, him at 87 and Hardy at 110, I don't know how many people this is going to affect, but <laughs> I think they should be a lot closer together. And I'd probably actually rank, rank Hardy a smidge above uh, uh, above Shakir. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think both are cheap enough where, look, we we want to invest in the Bills offense wherever we can, especially, you know, getting a cheap, you know, their number three wide receiver, whether it's Shakir or Hardy remains to be seen. But I'm kind of fading the situation because you mentioned it. They drafted Dalton Kincaid, which means – they're either going to run more two tight end sets or Kincaid's going to run out Mm -hmm. of the slot more. So I just think Kincaid's going to sort of take over this number three wide receiver role. Um, You know, the McKenzie or, you know, uh, Cole Beasley type role. So I just think the offense is going to, it's going to change in that way. So maybe Shakir and Hardy just aren't going to be used as much as people think. Um, So, yeah, I just, I haven't been investing in this number three wide receiver slot at all. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just looking at them relative to each other. Yeah. I think you know, oh, yeah, 30, that... 33 slots or, or whatever, 20, what, yeah. 23 slots is a lot. Yeah. Uh, considering I, I think it's, you know, neck and neck. Uh, but yeah, let's talk about those tight ends. Kincaid's going tight end 17 and Dawson Knox is going one spot above him at tight end 60. Now yeah. I, I will say this Kincaid, obviously he's a rookie went uh, late in the first round out of Utah did play uh, about uh, 55% out of the slot and, and uh, another 10% out wide. So about two thirds of his snaps were essentially as a wide receiver uh, in his final year uh, at school last year, but he would need about 98, just under a hundred half PPR points to finish as a tight end 17. Uh, about five rookie tight ends have done that uh, over the past decade, 10 since uh, the league went to 32 teams in 2002. So it's rare. It happens about once every other year. Um, but Kincaid certainly, I think, has the talent to do it. Um, so so what do you think about that that tight end 17 ADP and then also about Knox going one spot higher? Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. I think we saw the ADP flip. Um, it used to be the other way around, which made sense. So I think we're getting some decent value on Kincaid right now. Um, I think he should go inside the top 15. He just has a ton of upside in this offense. And I, I really do think he was the best catch, catching tight end in this class, I would compare his upside similar to like Mark Andrews. I, I'm not saying he will be that good, but that's certainly what his ceiling is. So when you, when you talk about like past rookie seasons, he's certainly capable of, you know, finishing in the top 15. Uh, he just landed in a great offense. I think that's first and foremost, why I love him. They could use him in the slot. He could be a red zone weapon. So there's a ton of pass to him hitting value here. I probably wouldn't take him over a Greg Dulcich or a Chig Kwanku. But I would certainly take him over a Cole Komet 
or Dawson Knox. So I think that's kind of how I'm valuing him. So I think he should be, you know, tight end 15. That's where I'd probably take him. I think that's sort of baking in his upside with the potential risk of taking a rookie. Um, And on the other side, I'm just fading Dawson Knox. I think, you know, he's probably a little bit overpriced. He he still has touch on upside. You know, I think they're still going to use him um, pretty much the same, especially in the red zone. But again, like I, I think that Kincaid is going to hit, um, you know, his target share and potentially his his uh, red zone share as well. So I think he certainly limits Knox upside. So um, I, I'm passing on Knox being one slot higher than Kincaid right now. Yeah, so uh, I, I totally agree. I think I think Kincaid does have some upside, but I, I, again, I, I, DeAndre Hawkins would also impact him as well, right? Yeah, so, yeah hell yeah. Um, he would impact everybody. Right, but. right. So, <laughs> Uh, you know, to recap, I, I know you, you like Gabe Davis as a sweeper. For me, yep. I, I like I like Kincaid and, and Deontay Hardy if once Deont- uh, DeAndre Hopkins is off the board and he's not in Buffalo, then give me some Kincaid uh, and give me Hardy in, in super deep leaves as like a, a fade on uh, Shakir. And, and I know we're both on the same page as far as, uh, you know, overvalued guys. It's, it's Dawson Knox at tight end 16. Yeah. Uh, I think he's going to be much more of a blocker. It was a very good blocker, uh, but it just hasn't really put it together as a receiver outside of, you know, touchdowns, which are, as we know, hard to count on um, from week to week and, and even and season to season as well. I, I'm, I'm also uh, way off, way out, excuse me, on, on Damian Harris. I think he's going to be a bust at RB41 uh, and, and obviously Shakir. So, uh, let's go to the Jets. Uh, Aaron Rodgers is the QB 14. I know we were low on him as ADP has come down a little bit. Mm-hmm. There's probably not too many quarterbacks you can fade him with beyond <laughs> QB 14, yeah. but I still don't love him because John, I mean, this dude in the first six weeks of the season, he faces defenses that finished one, two, three, seven, and eight in past <laughs> DVOA. So I, I, it's hard for me to, you know, want to draft him and redraft. He had career lows in as a starter last year in yards per attempt, passer rating, QBR, uh, no top five finishes last year. I know he had the thumb, but he's also old. I, I, I'd rather jump off uh, a year too soon than a year too later. He's just not very intriguing. Is there any reason for me to change my mind? No, not really, because you could still get Jared Goff two slots later. <laughs> yes, um, so as absolutely. long as you can get Jared Goff after Rodgers, I'm still fading him. But it was interesting to see his ADP drop five slots, so I'm more in line with it now. Um, but I, I do think this this team change will be closer to the Peyton Manning, Tom Brady late career team change than the Russell Wilson one. Um, but, you know, Rodgers doesn't have the same caliber weapons that Manning and Brady did on their new team. So I don't think we're going to see like an eruption like we saw with those guys. However, I think getting to play with a true alpha like Garrett Wilson after having a year off without Devontae Adams last year will help Rodgers. But again, he just doesn't have that rushing upside that he used to earlier in his career. Um, so I just don't see overspending on him. I think this is properly where he should be. He's going to be a high end QB2 uh, and he's going to make the Jets better as a real team, but this doesn't really move the needle for me uh, in terms of fancy, but the jets are going to have a solid defense. So he's probably not going to have to throw that much. So there's just a lot of reasons, like you said, to just kind of not fade him, but just not overdraft. I'll I'll fade him. I'll fade him. I'm fine. Fade fade him. him. Fading is fine with me. (laughs) By taking like a Jared Goff or Geno Smith that are going after them. I'd rather have those guys. So it's an easy call to not draft them at 14 right now. Yeah. yeah. And again, I, like I said, once you're in 14, now you're in that streaming territory in redraft right. too. And that's where that early season schedule, I mean, Philly, New True. England, Dallas, yeah. Denver, Buffalo, yeah. that is a hard schedule. And you got a good defense. These could be like 17, 14 games, yep. you know, like, so, uh, and Hackett, let's be real. He, he didn't call plays when Rodgers was going for his MVP years a couple years ago. Yes, he was there in Green Bay, but he didn't call plays. He was a disaster calling plays with Denver. He, was a disa- he wasn't very good anywhere he's been calling plays. So, like, this could be a situation where just Rodgers' brilliance has, been, you know, kind of propped up Hackett. And now that Rodgers is not quite as good, Hackett was never good. This might be kind of like a non-story with, oh, you know, he's reuniting with Hackett. And, like, I, I, just, I just see, like, a, like, I don't really see much to like in terms of investing in Rodgers. Uh, let's we'll talk about the running backs. Let's 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 go. Let's keep on the passing game here. Okay. Um, because you mentioned Garrett Wilson, he's wide receiver yeah. eleven. Uh, I think that's fair because he's just so good. And 
you know, we always expect wide receivers these days because they get so much work in year one to have their breakout more often times than not in year two, rather than year three, which it used to be. Uh, and, you know, Rogers uh, about over a half yard or attempt more than a jet quarterback touchdown rate doubled 2.4 for jets quarterbacks last year, percent uh, 4.8% for Rogers last year and his career, uh, you know, 6.2 uh, and 7.7 yards per attempt uh, and 6.2%, yeah. you know, touchdown rate. So there is some upside there, but that I rather invest in Garrett Wilson, you know, if I'm going to take uh, you know, a jet pass passing game, player in the top 12 how about you yeah absolutely and you know Wilson was able to finish as the wide receiver 19 and establish himself as one of the better young wide receivers last year despite the Jets just disaster at quarterback last season so I think this is where having Aaron Rodgers is really going to make a difference you know he's going to have a future Hall of Famer throwing the ball I think that's going to take his game to the next level so uh, you know Rodgers typically does spend like that like to spend a lot of time building chemistry with you know his top pass catchers, that's why they brought in Lazard. That's why they brought in Randall Cobb. But I think he'll hit the ground running with Wilson. Um, and he's he's in my top ten. I'm a little bit higher uh, than his ADP right now. I think this is where Rodgers will certainly make an impact and unlocking Wilson's upside. So I think Wis Wilson will certainly be a top ten uh, wideout this year. Yeah, and if you if you consider Watson, Rodgers wide receiver one last year uh, mm -hmm. rather than Lazard, uh, and you average out, you know. The last five years, watch uh Rogers is top receiver, 28% targets per route. Uh Wilson was 23% last year. And just, you know, even without changing the quarterback, you usually expect the jump just um yeah. year one to year two. So, you know, the lowest Rogers ever had was 24%, which was Christian Watson uh last year at for a wide receiver one. And over the last five years, uh the lowest Rogers ever had was 2.1 yards per route and the highest was three yards per route for his wide receiver one Wilson was at a uh, buck 85 so room to grow uh in in both yes. even if Rodgers you know plays at his 2022 level which I have a sneaking suspicion uh he may yeah. but uh I, I know you like Aaron Allen Lazar uh you, you like him last year as well uh, that was a great call. He is the wide receiver 55. He got signed uh, for four years, 44 mil by the Jets, 22 million guaranteed, which, yeah. uh, you know, that is a lot more guaranteed than McCole Hardman, who got about four mil guaranteed, and Randall Cobb, who just got 250K guaranteed. Corey Davis is also there with an 11 mil cap hit, but, you know, they could cut him for, I think, just like under a million in dead cap. So, uh, they they definitely paid for Alan Lazard, uh, you know, for, for Rodgers. So what, what do you see for his outlook uh, this season? Yeah. So, you know, like I mentioned on our previous pod, I, I do like Lazard in this range. Um, you know, I think he's definitely underrated at, you know, the wide receiver 55 range. He's not an elite talent or flashy. Uh, so I get it's not a sexy pick, but the Jets brought him in for a reason because he already has a ton of chemistry with Aaron Rodgers. Um, and I, I think that's why they're going to hit the ground running. Um, and he just has a ton of upside in this offense. So he could easily put up wide receiver three numbers uh, and pay off his ADP here. And just when you look at the other receivers in, going in this range, you get you know, Adam Thielen, Zay Jones, KJ Osborne, Tyler Boyd, guys that j I don't really see a path to this much upside. And they don't even have as high of a floor. So I think he just sticks out like a sore thumb uh, in this range. So that's why I've been getting a ton of Lazard. Uh, in this range. So um, yeah, even though he kind of, kind of a disappointing for me last year, I had higher expectations, but he still panned out. Uh, same thing going on this year. I think just the market's way too low on him. Yeah. I, I'm, I think I'm more kind of right on the market. Cause again, I, there's just one of these situations where I, I do see your point about the upside, but I do see some downside just because a little bit of uncertainty with their, they're saying Corey Davis is going to be on the team. We initially thought he was probably going to get cut or traded uh, yeah. because of that big cap hit. Uh, but, in, uh, you know, he's there and McCole Hardman's there. And, you know, they're talking about expanding his route tree this year. Uh, that was part of, you know, the, the promise they made to him when they signing him. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I just wonder, you know, Lazard had a career high 92% routes, uh, route participation per game last yeah. year. Uh, I just wonder, you know, we've seen uh, on Green Bay the last few years, whether it's been last year or with the with the Rodgers Hackett pairing, you know, their wide receiver two has been more in that like 75 to 85 range. 
And I, I just wonder if, it, you know, we might see a, a tiny bit of a decrease because if you got Davis, if you're going to keep Davis on the team uh, and you sign Hardman, like Cobb, I could see being a scratcher getting like, you know, yeah. and a, one or two snaps, a few snaps a game. But I, I think you're going to have to give Davis and, and Hardman at least some decent playing time, you know, maybe not half the snaps, but Davis never played less than two thirds of the snaps when he's been healthy. So you know that there's just a little bit of uncertainty there. I, I think as maybe as it clears up, I, I'll become you know I'll, I'll go closer to you. Yeah. But right now I'm kind of I, I see the upside, but I don't see the downside. Fair enough. Uh, here's a guy I like though, Tyra Conklin's tight end, 27, mm -hmm. and CJ Uzoma's over 30 now. Uh, they drafted Zach Koontz, but you know he's a day three pick, probably a year away from from contributing. And Conklin was the tight end, 21. Uh, twenty in twenty two in PPR and half PPR last year, and he was fourteenth in receptions per game at three point four, eighteenth in yards per game uh, at just under thirty three. But he was twenty eighth, tied for twenty eighth in touchdowns per game, uh, mm -hmm. at you know uh, like point eight one eight. So if you, you know, there is some upside there because obviously you expect Rodgers to throw more touchdowns. Uh, I see like a. 2020 Tunyon year as the the ceiling for him. Like he doesn't have to change anything about his usage really, and you know he's about 17 target percent targets per route. Tight ends don't tend to change drastically, um, you know, as much as like the wide receivers are going to change depending on you know if Wilson takes a step forward. So uh, especially with Brees Hall a little bit iffy, uh, you know, to start the season and, and his pass catching prowess, uh, I think Top Conklin could beat this tight end 27 ADP and has some upside to beat it uh, pretty well. Uh, but, but what do you think? Yeah, no, I love that call. Um, I was actually going to mention the 2020 Robert Tunyon year as well. Uh, I think that's a fair, uh, you know, path to a ceiling, but he was able to establish himself as the lead tight end over CJ Zoma last season. You know, he was averaging right around what 75% uh, routes run per game. So that's, that's a ton of usage. To, and then you have Aaron Rodgers as your quarterback. So I think, um, you know, he could see a ton of targets, especially in the red zone to, yeah, like you said, massively pay off in the tight end 27 range. Like I'd much rather have him than a Hunter Henry or Noah Fant or guys like that. So I think, yeah, he sticks out in that range just based on his ceiling. Yeah. And obviously a small sample, but Tyra Conklin, six of his eight career targets inside the 10 have been touchdowns. The Jets were 21st in pass plays inside the 10 last year. Uh, Rodgers, the Rodgers Hackett pairing uh, from 2019 to 21, second, in, uh, third, excuse nice. me, in inside the 10 pathway, second in touchdowns inside the 10. Uh, so there is some upside, even if Conklin is just kind of that, you know, a red zone specialist. So uh, I like him. Reese Hall, uh, you know, let's go to the running game. I am a little yeah. bit iffy on him at RB13 just because of what we've heard. You know, he tore his ACL week seven. The G GM Do Doug Joe Douglas has said we got to protect him from himself. Uh, I think I mentioned this on another pod, but over 20% of his yardage came on two touches last year, a 62-yard <laughs> uh, run and a 79-yard catch. So uh, you have the that, and then the O-line should be better and healthier, but long way up to go because they were dead last in adjusted line yards. So uh, I just think I just think this is kind of a little bit too presumptive here uh, unless we get just – you know, absolute clarity that Brees Hall yeah. is going to be a full go from week one on. Because remember, you know, he could be, he could start the year slow. He could come, like, running backs are still likely to get injured more than any other position. So he, if, if you're losing games at the beginning, that doesn't mean he's just yeah. going to play once he's healthy. Like, he could easily get hurt again. So uh, RB13, a little too rich for me uh, for Brees. Yeah, he, he's tough right now because I, I think he does have the talent to be a top five back. He was by far my favorite running back. Uh, in last year's class, I said he was a blend of all the good qualities of Joe mm -hmm. Mixon and Kareem Hunt, and I mean that. Um, so we've seen him in limited time just erupt. Um, however, like you said, just his ACL tear, you know, we don't know if he's going to be ready to go week one. This this could turn into a 2021 Saquon Barkley or a 2022 J.K. Dobbins type of situation where we caution people. Like, he, he could be really limited the first few weeks, and even then, you know, just not see a big workload. So – um, we're just gonna have to monitor the news. Um, so I think that RB 13 is fair, just factoring that in. But I think if, if we get ultimate clarity, like he's going to be hundred percent for week one, I would draft him inside the top eight for sure. 
Um, but if he's going to miss a few games, then I would bump him down. So I think right now it's fair, but this is going to be one of those ranks that's moving around. Um, and they did draft a pretty talented back in Israel at Benacanda. That's a tongue twister. And they sell Michael Carter. So they could easily just, you know, limit his workload in the first half of the season with those guys. So it, it's definitely a concern, but I think undoubtedly he's, you know, potentially a top five back in this league. Yeah, and, and I love Abanakanda, you know, fifth rounder out of pit, good speed, uh, 25 or more carries uh, in over half his games last year, so we can handle uh, the load. Carter had a big sophomore slump, um, so I'm a little concerned. Uh, yeah. You know, it wasn't just the O-line. You know, he also lost uh, nearly a yard after contact uh, per carry. He lost 5% off his targets per route, uh, which is a massive drop in two, two yards off his yards per catch. Uh, Zonovan Knight, uh, was near the bottom of the league in in, in most metrics uh, for running backs, uh, you know, rush running the ball and had just 3.5 yards per carry. No, uh, no guaranteed money. He was an undrafted free agent last year. So, uh, you know, if, if Hall is healthy uh, week one, I don't even think Knight makes the roster. Right. But I, I think Abana Kanda is a is a low key dark horse, just like we saw Knight kind of emerge after a mm-hmm. while as the lead back, like. I think Abanakanda is is a guy who I want to invest in. Um, I, I think he could end up having some games where he ends up starting uh, if Brees Hall is is not fully healthy. So, um, yeah, that that that's kind of where I'm at. Uh, I know your sleeper. To recap, your sleeper uh, is Aaron, Alan Lazard. Uh, I'm going with Abanakanda. Love him uh, and Tyra Conklin. Uh, and then no one uh, you're really marking off as a bust uh, for yeah. me. Reese Hall, uh, just, you know, uh, I think he's overvalued based on what we know and don't know at this point. And Zonovan Knight, RB80, I just think they're, you know, I don't know how many, again, how many people this would affect, but I, I just think, I, I don't think he makes the roster if uh, Hall is healthy. So, uh, you know, I think there are better ways you could invest like a deep flyer, late round flyer. Uh, all right, let's go to Miami. This will be a little quicker because, you know, mm-hmm. we kind of know what to expect with them. We'll start with the pass game again because I want to, spend most of the time talking about the run game. Uh, Tua was a QB 12. Uh, he was somewhat inconsistent because he was QB nine in points per game, but, uh, you know, top four in four of his 13 games. And, you know, then 13, uh, 13 to 18th in, in, in five and, and 22nd or worse in, in, in another three. So, you know, oh, about over 60% of his games, he was not a QB one. Uh, any thoughts on Tua here? Enter, uh, entering his fourth year in the league. Yeah, I mean, as, as long as he stays healthy, I love him. As long as he, Terry Kill, and Jalen Waddle stay healthy, I love him. But I am definitely concerned with just the, the concussions last year, if he gets another one. Um, you know, he he contemplated retirement. So that's, that's obviously a red flag and a concern for his health. Um, but while he's healthy, he's certainly a top 12 quarterback. Um, you know, the, the other thing is they seem to have given up on tight end being a factor in this offense by letting Mike Kosicki go. So this is a very top heavy offense. It runs through Tyreek Hill uh, and Jalen Waddle. But um, I think adding Devon A-Chain, who we'll talk about, could be a game changer. He's a, he's a good pass catching back. So I think that could add an element to this offense. But I think Tua has a ton of upside. But unfortunately, there's just so much downside given the potential, you know, the concussion history. So I'm probably staying away at his current ADP, but I, I do like investing in this offense because of him. Yeah. And, you know, QB2, I think it's fair. I also yeah. worry. I think the Dolphins defense is going to be uh, yeah. a lot better this Legit. year. So that yeah. that's also kind of kind of the same thing as, as Rodgers. Like Q, QB is just not as, as sexy as it has been in some years past where we always could find like a Justin Fields or Jalen Hurts or, or somebody like that. Um, it just seems like we're kind of stuck with these, like pass uh, pocket quarterbacks now, like we're getting really excited about Jared Goff here, which <laughs> I, I mean, I think it's warranted, but also yeah. kind, of, kind of worries me. Uh, yeah. Tyreek is wide receiver three. Waddle's wide receiver 10. Um, you know, nothing, nothing much to say here, except I, I think Tyreek was a little bit more consistent overall. Uh, and he actually had a career high in targets per route at 31.3%, which was always good to see, you know, going from, you know, the long time chiefs offense Waddle, was at 85 yards per game uh, with Tua, but only 62 yards per game without Tua. And he scored in about two thirds of his game with Tua and and didn't score in the four without, obviously small sample here. But uh, I think, you know, if there was another injury to Tua, Wada would have a little bit lower of a floor, but 
Um, yeah, like I, I could see maybe taking him below Garrett Wilson because Garrett Wilson has that 30% target upside. Yeah. You know, but that's about it. I still think he's worthy of, you know, a top top 11, 12, 13, it, you know, somewhere in that range. He certainly, he proved that he's certainly worthy, especially with no tight end and no real even wide receiver three. I mean, you got Berrios there, you got Chosen Anderson, but not, nothing much mm-hmm. to speak of. Smith, Smythe blocked on over 50% of his snaps last year. So um, yeah, I, I, don't, I think we should just talk about these running backs because, yeah. uh, you know, A-Chain, RB42. So his price is getting up there. People are caught on to him. Uh, third round pick out of Texas, 4.3 speed. Uh, just 188 pounds, but, uh, you know, was able to carry the ball uh, 20 plus times uh, in, in a few games last year. And he actually had a high of 38 carries. So it's not as if he couldn't carry the load. Not a great pass blocker, but Miami's running backs don't pass block much. Just 11% of the time last year, their tight ends 20% and probably going up because Smythe, as I mentioned, blocked over half yeah. uh, his snaps. Now, uh, you know, HN at 42, Mostert at 49, Wilson at 51. Uh, those two guys got about two, two mil guaranteed, a uh, uh, little over two mil for, for Wilson, two mil for, for Mostert. Uh, but I think we both like A-Chain, uh, which for me means we have to be out on, on Mostert and Wilson. Mm-hmm. And then there's also the, the Dalvin Cook factor uh, because it was reported, I think it was today actually, that Miami pursued DeAndre Swift in a trade. So, um, you know, that's the only reason I think we can't go all in on A-Chain because they're obviously at the top uh, top contender for, for Cook, and they're obviously looking to upgrade that backfield. But I, I think what this means for me is I'm all the way out on Mostert and Wilson. Mostert, 31, by the way, but but what do you think of this backfield? Yeah, so uh, again, Dalvin Cook uh, potentially signing with the Dolphins or other teams is looming over sort of these, like, fringe running backs. So A-Chain, there's certainly some concern there, but I still like – the upside he provides at RB 42 range. Um, and this, this backfield is very tricky to project. It could be a full three-way committee, mm-hmm. uh, but I think a chain, his value will only go up as the season continue goes on and most are probably go down. But um, I love a chain just in this scheme. He's very fast. He fits this scheme very well. Uh, plus he's, he's a pretty good pass catching back. Um, and like I said, the Dolphins seem to be just eliminating the tight end position completely. You know, they have Durham Smythe there. So I think, you know, A-Chain could be the number three target in this offense. Uh, Mm -hmm. He has the potential to, and I I kind of pegged him as being a potential dollar store Austin Eckler um, coming out of the draft. So he, he just has a ton of upside in this offense and he probably doesn't need that many touches to post, you know, RB2 type numbers. So I like getting his upside here again. When, when you talk about Raheem Mozart, um, he's 31 years old. He's probably going to have the most value early in the season. I would not be shocked if he's like the week one starter, but then as the season goes, concede some snaps or potentially get injured. Uh, and we'll see a chain um, be more of the workhorse back. Uh, and then Jeff Wilson's just there, you know, he's probably the, the goal line back, but uh, even though he's the cheapest back in this backfield, I don't think he's worth investing in either. I think this is just a murky backfield and I'm actually going with the more expensive guy here and a chain just because I think he does carry the highest, highest ceiling in this backfield. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's, he's, he's a guy I'm going with too, uh, for a sweeper for the dolphins, but with the caveat that I, I would wait till Dalvin cook, uh, either has Dying a new somewhere. team yeah, or, just... <laughs> or he's the situation is settled because, uh, RB 42 in a, you know, you already got three guys in this backfield. Uh, obviously you probably, you know, get rid of one of Mostert or Wilson because a chain is the rookie, but still too much uncertainty at, at RB 42 for me anyway, uh, until we can be sure that, that cook is not getting there. But I, like, was, I think it's a good sign that they tried to sign Swift because a chain and Swift, I think overlap the most in terms yeah. of, of a skill set. I, I would be worried about cream hunt too. He's another yeah, name. Exactly. Out there. yeah. There's just a few free agents at each position. Um, that worry me. Um, so I like Kareem Hunt could land here, but either way, just this time of year, you have to be aware of that. Um, I'm not really altering my rankings a ton based on that, but you just have to be aware of it. Yeah. And like for me, the, uh, uh, I know you don't have like a, a, a flat out bus for me. I think Mostert and Wilson are, are going to be huge busts. you know, already part of a three-way committee. Uh, both of them passed, you know, the, the kind of peak year of a running back, which is 26, 27, um, you know, so, and the, and the fact that they've been, you know, known to look, go after Swift known to be the top destination for cook. They obviously want to upgrade on these two guys, uh, and probably aren't looking at them, you know, beyond, 
you know, you know, far into the future. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm out on them. I think those guys will be busts. Uh, let's finish it up with the New England Patriots. We have, you know, Bill O'Brien replacing Matt Patricia. And, you know, I think O'Brien could be a little bit more pass happy here. Uh, 59% career called pass rate, 62%. Uh, the last three years. And when I say last three, I mean 2018, 2019, and then the four weeks of 2020 before he got fired. Uh, so, you know, he's a little more pass heavy than the Patriots have been with, under Mac Jones with Mac Jones uh, over the last two years, about 57% called passes. Uh, O'Brien also uses the tight end a little bit more. Uh, so that, that could have some, you know, some interesting um, kind of impact. Uh, and we'll talk about that. But I think my question for you at Mac Jones, he's a QB 29, you know, can he, can he return? Can he rebound to that 2021 rookie year level when he was at, you know, 7.3 yards per attempt, 4.2% touchdown rate, as opposed to last year when he get to 6.8 yards an attempt uh, and a touchdown rate of just 3.2, because, you know, I think that rookie year is just like a baseline for him even being playable. And you'd actually hope that he even improved upon that. So uh, how are you kind of projecting Matt Jones and weighing, you know, 2022 versus 2021? Yeah. Yeah, so I think he could rebound. You know, I think um, having a traditional offensive corner like Bill O'Brien will certainly help. Uh, it'll be an upgrade over last year's disaster with Matt Patricia and Joe Judge sort of trying to figure it out on the fly. Um, but I, I want nothing to do with Mac Jones, uh, even at QB 29. I mean, he's a low ceiling, low floor option, which is a terrible combination. He offers zero rushing upside. Um, and he doesn't throw enough to to really be a high end QB two. Plus, he doesn't really have great job security. He already got benched last year for Bailey Zappi. Who's to say that couldn't happen again at some point this year? So, just I, I want nothing to do with him in redraft, and especially nothing to do with him in best ball. So, I'm completely on Mac Jones at this price. All right, let's talk about the receivers. Uh, Juju is wide receiver forty five. And then you go 40 more slots before you get another patch wide receiver. That's Tyquan Thornton at 85. Uh, Kayshawn Butte, uh, the rookie, is 99. And Devontae Parker at 102. Kendrick Bourne's not even being drafted, uh, at least in this ADP. But seems somewhat crowded. Uh, I like Juju a little bit. Uh, you like Parker. Uh, so... So Parker, I think, is the more interesting one. So let's start with him, and, and then and then I'll, I'll tell you why I, I like Juju. <laughs> well, like is doing a lot of heavy lifting there. I, I I would say at his ADP, you know, you can get Parker outside of the top hundred. Uh, makes him enticing because he could still be a, a eighty percent or more routes run per game kind of guy, um, and he's he's decent in best ball. You know, he's going to have a few big games. Um, so I think if if you can get Parker outside of the top 100, he makes sense. But I I, I do I kind of want to hear what you have to say about Juju. But I'm a little bit higher on him. I think he does have a pretty high floor, especially since you know he might be taking over the full Jacoby Myers role. Uh, yep. But I'm interested to hear what you think because I'm a little bit higher on him as well. Yeah, I didn't expect to be uh, high on Juju, but I think wide receiver 45 is a bit too low. Uh, Juju, first of all, he's still only 27. He got 16 million dollars guaranteed now uh that's a significant uh, uh investment for the patriots and uh I, I do think that the myers role is what he's going to play and that would lead to an uptick in slot usage uh myers had 70 percent juju just 43 percent last year and remember juju is still a, a startable wide receiver three last year a little bit up and down but overall you know still close to a thousand yards uh receiving the touchdowns weren't there they never were for myers either so that's kind of a wash but uh, you look at Myers, you know, targets per route, 23, 23% uh, two years ago and 22% last year. Juju's been around 18%. And in this offense, I mean, Parker's kind of a, an X receiver guy that's not really going to move around much. So you can't expect him necessarily, especially at the other side of 30 to get, you know, like 20s, 20 something. Uh, Tyquan Thornton could take a year to eat, but he's, you know, he was, he's another guy that was, you know, he's running more of those lower percentage routes. Um, and then, you know, the tight ends, you know, Hunter Henry took a bit of a step back. Uh, Gesicki, I think is, you know, he only got one, a little over a one mil guaranteed. So I, I think he'll probably have a bigger role than Juju, but, uh, I, I still think Miss Schuster, uh, is going to be ticketed for this, uh, this, this Jacoby Myers role. And that role has been, 
you know, a, a wide receiver, anywhere from, you know, wide receiver uh, 42 to wide receiver 27. And, and Smith Schuster has been taking, uh, being taken below kind of the floor ceiling for Myers. So even if you factor in a little bit of, okay, maybe Myers is the better player at this stage. Uh, I still think you have a pretty decent floor, especially uh, in PPR for, for Juju, because, you know, we don't know exactly where the touchdowns are going to come from. Not expecting a massive jump for, for Mac Jones, but uh, I do like, especially also got to consider the matchups in this division, right? You have, you know, the Bills have Tredavious White on the outside. The Jets have Sauce on the outside. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Dolphins have Howard and, and, and Ramsey on the outside. So, like, I, I think the slot receiver is going to be important, even if it's just in two wide sets and he's lined up, you know, in the slot, in the in the twin set. Uh, mm-hmm. So, I, yeah, I, I like me some Juju at, at 45. I think anything outside the top 40 is fair game. Uh, for for Smith Schuster, he should probably be in the high thirties. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. And he, he finished as the wide receiver thirty seven last year, despite being the number one wide receiver on the Chiefs. But we have to remember he was the number two target behind mm-hmm. Travis Kelsey. But I, I see a clear path to being the top target yep. on the Patriots. So that's that's huge for his floor. Um, and I think you had mentioned it towards the end of last season. You know, for some reason Juju is fading towards the end of the season. I don't know if you're able to pinpoint why. But he's only 26 years old, so it's not age-related. He's still in his prime, so I still think he could bounce back. I, I think he'll be the number one target in this offense. So I think in this range, the 40, wide receiver 45 range, it sort of depends what you're going for. If you're going for upside, I'd rather take a flyer on the rookies. You know, Jordan Addison, Quentin Johnson are, are in this range, or just go for a super high floor like Juju Smith in this range. I think those three receivers inside, you know, the wide receiver 40 to the wide receiver 50 – will be the three re- receivers I'm targeting the most in this range. So if you're going for a high floor, absolutely target Juju here. Yeah. And I actually think, you know, the difference between a high floor and a high ceiling in this range is actually less than, you know, one might think. Because let's remember, there are just a ton of good receivers. Like Terry McLaurin is like the wide receiver 21 or something like that. You know, like there's there's always so many receivers that aren't going to finish top 24. Myers was the wide receiver 28. Uh, and 27 in PPR and half last year. So yeah. like, that's a pr- that's a pretty good upside. Um, and, and Juju has had a top 10 season in, in, in his past. So, um, yeah, I, I like Juju. Uh, let's talk about the tight ends. Gesicki is 20. Henry's 29. Uh, Gesicki had got a one-year, $4.5 million deal, a little over one mil guaranteed, though, but uh, another four and a half in incentives. Um, 55% of the routes last year still finishes a tight end 34 um, what, what do you think about his role this year uh, with Hunter Henry still on the squad? Oh, I absolutely hate this landing spot. I, you know, I love Mike Kosicki. I still think he's one of the better pass catching tight ends in the league. Uh, you know, if he were to land on the Bengals, Lions or Bills, I'd be all over him. But this is a terrible landing spot. They still have Hunter Henry. Uh, I don't know if they're going to know how to use them necessarily. We were already saying, you know, Juju's going to be the slot receiver. So I don't know where Gusecki's going to line up. So I think this is a terrible landing spot. He's my tight end 20, but he had the potential to be a top 25 tight end. Um, so I, I still think he's the tight end to target from this offense. I think Hunter Henry is being overdrafted even at tight end 30. Um, but either way, I, I'm just fading both tight ends uh, in this offense. I actually disagree. I think I think Henry is the better value. I, I think really, yeah, because listen, Let's one million later, one minute. Well, first of all, Gasicki got one million dollars guaranteed. So like it's Juju's. Uh, John Smith played about. John Smith got thirty-one mil guaranteed a couple years ago. Mm-hmm. He played. He proceeded to play about a quarter of the routes, a quarter of the snaps, uh, in the past game over the. Uh, you know, once he got that thirty-one mil guaranteed, uh, I, I think Henry's role actually stays pretty similar. You know. 60 70 percent routes i think gasicki maybe you know maybe he gets up to 40 50 because i mentioned o'brien about 10 to 50 percent more tight end uh routes uh than uh the patriots have had over these last two years with mac jones so i, I do think gasicki i think i do think it could draw a little more evenly but i still think henry is going to get more routes i think he has more touchdown upside uh and because henry is more of a traditional blocker and receiver you know like he could do both with the fact that they gave 16 mil to Juju, um, you know, and and the fact that Gasicki's best role is probably more of a team that like like a Bills team that could use like Kincaid as the slot receiver, you know, like I, I don't think that is this team. So I actually do think Henry 
Uh, I'm projecting Henry to outscore Gesicki on media. Now, maybe you could argue Gesicki's ceiling is higher, but I actually yeah. think Henry's is because um, we've seen Henry be a beast in the red zone with Mac Jones. You know, so I I, I like Henry. I, I could be wrong here, but I, I think Henry's role just isn't going to change very much. You know, I think what we saw last year was probably the floor. What we saw the year before when he had all the touchdowns, is probably the ceiling. Uh, but overall, yeah, I think it comes out to a, a higher median uh, for uh, for Henry. But I mean, obviously, both of these guys are outside <laughs> the top top twenty. So yeah. we're only talking about two tight end leagues. Uh, quickly, Ramondre RB eleven, yay nay, properly valued. Uh, I would say properly valued. I, I have RB ten. I always wanted to be a little bit higher on him. I think he has a ton of upside. But we just have to remember that sort of the perfect storm happened last year, um, where you know James White retired. Ty Montgomery got injured. Damian Harris got hurt. Um, still have a little bit more competition, but I think he proved last year he could be the workhorse back. Um, so he's in my top 10, but he, you got to be careful with him. You know, things can change. Bill Belichick has been known to have committees. So he, I, w- I won't say frozen pond, but he does have more downside than I think people think. Yeah, I think I, I think that's the fair way to look at it. Like, I love the yards after contact, 3.8 last year, third out of 60 uh, qualified running backs, according to PFF. Uh, but... Uh, I do kind of worry about the pass game usage. It was very high last year. Um, and, you know, more so than the yards per route was high, just he got a lot yeah. of routes. And O'Brien has used running backs less and tight ends more in the past game. If you remember like a Lamar Miller, he would get like, you know, 16, 17, 18 carries, but not yeah. not as many routes run out of the backfield. So I think that is a little bit of a concern. I prefer to draft a wide receiver in this range. I think that's, Absolutely. that's what I'm getting at. You can um, get T Higgins or Chris Olave. Here. Right. Right. That's yeah. What I was going to say, so I won't say flat out bust. I, I won't say our 11 is the wrong spot for mm-hmm. him in terms of the running backs, but I will say, I, I think overall, um, I, I think you want to be going wide receiver at that spot. Uh, James Robinson, RB 70, nothing guaranteed, but uh, could have, could emerge in, in that Damian Harris, Roll, you know, maybe get a you know six to to ten carries uh, a, a game, uh, and, and Pierre Strong Jr. is still there. He's going RB seventy four, so that's just one. I think we got to monitor. Um, yeah. You know, see if, if Robinson's healthy. I think he wins that role, and maybe a little bit of a of a value there. But um, in, until until we get any clarity, um, I, I don't I don't think there's a massive edge there. Uh, but yeah, let's let's wrap it up. You you like uh, to recap Devonte Parker. Uh, as an undervalued guy for the Patriots. Uh, and I like Juju. And then uh, in terms of bust, you're going Hunter Henry. Um, I'm not going to say he's undervalued, but I think he's a little more properly valued. I, and I'd mm-hmm. lean undervalued if 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 you had to, if I had to choose. But uh, you, you like him to bust, uh, and I like Gesicki to bust. So that'll be a fun one to uh, maybe we'll get some side action. <laughs> side on that bet, yeah. Hell yeah. yeah. But uh, that is going to wrap up our – AFC East uh, preview pod for the Fantasy Flex, our AFC East offseason preview. Uh, if you want to hear us talking NFC East, that episode will be up Friday right here on the Fantasy Flex feed. And stay tuned for our AFC and NFC North preview episodes next week. You can find Sean on Twitter at the underscore oddsmaker and me at Chris Raybon. And we're at those same handles on the free award winning Action Network app. Until next time, let's get this shmoney. 